Good evening, everyone. My name is Ryan. Um, I use he, him, his pronouns. And I am the program director of a program called Outlet, which is a program of adolescent counseling services. So I'm going to start by talking a little bit about um, Outlet and adolescent counseling services. So Outlet is a program of ACS, and we serve LGBTQ plus youth ages 10 to 25. And our service area includes San Mateo County and Santa Clara County. Um, so within that, um, there are a couple different types of things that we do. We focus on education. So we provide trainings and workshops um, around gender and sexuality and identity uh, to teens and to youth and young adults, also to service providers, to teachers, to other community members, kind of just increase awareness um, around gender and sexuality issues and also the experiences of LGBTQ youth. A big focus of what we do is we offer drop-in social support spaces for youth. Um, some of our groups are focused on youth ages 10 to 18 and others are focused on 18 to 25. We host our groups in a variety of locations. Some are at our main office in Redwood City. Some of them are at the San Mateo County Pride Center up in San Mateo and some of them are at CHAC in Mountain View. Those are our current group locations. We also have um, clinical interns who are um, experienced in working with LGBTQ youth, and so they also can provide therapy to youth and their families. Uh, and then another big component of our work is to do school support. So we do a lot of work with GSAs or QSAs um, supporting students directly, helping them get connected to resources, helping them kind of get ideas on what to do within their group. We do a lot of consultation work to schools, to teachers and staff on how to best support students, how to implement policies, things of that nature. And we do a lot of work on advocacy support, ensuring that policies and laws are being implemented, things like that. So we're going to talk about reducing anxiety and isolation in LGBTQ youth. I really try to have this be a conversation, especially in a smaller group like this. So definitely if folks have questions as we're going through, please just um, feel free to share your questions. I'll try to answer as many as I can in the moment. Um, and if we have to loop back to some later, um, but I'll try to make this not so much just throwing a bunch of information at you. So kind of just to dive in, I thought first to kind of just do sort of a quick grounding in kind of adolescent identity and sort of the experiences and uh, a lot of the changes that happen within adolescence, kind of just to use that as sort of a, a foundation to start this conversation. So a big part of what's going on, um, I call adolescent identity, I refer to as organized chaos because there's just a lot happening um, and a lot of changes. So if we think about the brain and brain development, the brain is really not fully developed until around the age of 25 and goes through significant rewiring and changing and reconfiguration between the ages of 11 and 19. So for youth, for young adults, this is just a constant change process. So those brain changes do things like impact short-term memory. Um, how many of you are parents or like have youth in your life that you work with or see on a consistent basis? Basically everyone, okay. Um, so you might see things like this. Um, so youth often have really intense but short-lived interests. Um, one week they're into the latest and greatest thing and the next week it's totally you know, so last week. Um, so it can be hard to keep up with what they're interested in and what they want to focus their time on. They also really prefer to have interactions with their peers as opposed to their caregiver. Um, and also, obviously, one of the big things, the big changes in adolescence is puberty. I'm guessing I probably don't need to say a lot about puberty. I'm sure folks remember theirs, but definitely the hormonal changes that happen in our bodies impact us physically, mentally, and emotionally. So in terms of emotional changes that occur, um, just a rapid process of changing emotions is kind of the norm within adolescence. Uh, with that, you see that self-esteem is all over the place. Um, at some points, your, your teen or your young adult might feel really good about themselves, and the next week they don't, and then something changes, and it's up again, and it's all over the place. Uh, locus of control. This is a super exciting clinical term. Um, so there's two 
locus of control, what that refers to is someone's sense of kind of control over their own life. So we refer to locus of control in two ways, internal and external. And someone who has a good sense of internal locus control feels like they're in charge of their life. They're kind of leading, kind of moving themselves through life. Whereas someone who has that externally focused feels like everything else is kind of controlling their life for them. So maybe their friends or their parents or their teachers, like other people are kind of in charge and sort of leading them through life as opposed to feeling like they're in charge of what's going on. And we see this changing all the time within adolescence. And in terms of some social changes, there's a constant push-pull of connection and separation with your caregiver, whether that be parent or other family members. Peers become a huge major influence in terms of behavior and attitude and activities that they participate in. Um, that is kind of one of the big developmental milestones of adolescence is to really focus your attention on your peer group and to begin to kind of separate from your parent or your caregiver. And it's normal for youth to not want to talk to their parents or caregivers, especially about things like sexual orientation or gender. The final piece of social changes is experimentation. So that's also very, very common in adolescence for youth to experiment with different groups, with different activities, maybe experiment with substances, things like that. Um, so that is a really common thing. If someone's experimenting with something, that doesn't mean that it's going to be a thing for them for their whole life. So somebody, for instance, might try a substance, they might try it two or three times and then realize that it was kind of not really that exciting and then never go back to it. So um, experimentation is definitely a thing that occurs and kind of navigating with your child through that, kind of what that looks like, setting appropriate limits. We'll talk about that later, but it is kind of a, a pretty normal thing to sort of test the boundaries and try some new things. So in short, adolescence is a time for struggling with a sense of identity or just kind of feeling really awkward about yourself. There is a focus on self, but also this alteration between high expectations and poor self-concept or low self-esteem or just kind of feeling crappy about yourself. So sometimes you feel really great about yourself, you think you're awesome, maybe the next day you think you're really lame and kind of stupid and all these other great things. Um, interest in clothing and um, all these kind of behaviors and attitudes and sort of what's cool and what's not cool is very influenced by the peer group. Moodiness occurs a lot in adolescence. A realization that your parents are not perfect. Sorry, but it does. They do figure it out at some point. Uh, less overt affection shown to your parents, sometimes being flat out rude to your parents occurs. Also complaints that parents interfere with your independence. I'm sure folks have heard this, like, can you just stay out of my business? Let me live my life. Uh, we see that a lot. And also a tendency to return to childish behaviors, especially when they're stressed. Um, some other things, an up and down and kind of just all over the place in terms of both physical and emotional energy. Risk taking, we talked a little bit about the experimentation. You know, increased curiosity, a sense of like wanting to live on the edge, um, but also their feelings can be easily hurt and kind of damaged and needing some repair. Um, a feeling of immortality, like they can just live forever. There's no consequences. It doesn't matter, you know, if you're doing this, you've got to think about your future. Meh, my future, it doesn't matter. It'll be there in 20 years when I'm old like you. Sort of that mentality of like, I can do whatever I want. Um, but also very, very worried about what their friends and their peers might think about them. A need for independence, yet still wanting to be pampered and protected and taken care of. Being withdrawn in a desire for a private life, but also worried still about this acceptance and this connection with peers. And demanding privileges, but avoiding the responsibilities. I'm sure no one has had experience with that before. So what exactly does anxiety look like? Anyone want to suggest what they think anxiety looks like? Mm -hmm. So sort of those physical manifestations of not sleeping. Mm -hmm, not sleeping. Mm -hmm. So it could be very situational. Yeah. You said worry. Mm -hmm. So sort of this really like hyper aware of what others are thinking or sort of are you judging me? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so some common symptoms, um, 
exactly like what was stated, excessive prolonged worry about many things in life. So sort of a situational, like I have a big test on Friday and I'm really stressed about it, may not be anxiety, so to speak, or it's just sort of, sort of a situational thing based on that as opposed to just sort of, sort of over, overarching kind of all-consuming concerns, worries about you know, maybe school life, family life, um, it affecting kind of various areas of their life is sort of one of the distinctions. Um, a, a difficulty controlling your sense of worry, like you can't, it's really hard to calm yourself down, it's really hard to kind of get centered, it's hard to just really let it go, set it aside, it's just kind of consuming. Restlessness kind of fits to those sort of physical things along with that. Um, it could be the flip side of being fatigued, tired, worn out. Um, it's interesting the number of mental health conditions that when they manifest in adolescence look like they're just being kind of lazy. Um, so I often see parents, including my own, because I have a teenage sister, um, who are, my parents are just like, she just like hangs out, she doesn't do anything, and I'm, you know, and I'm like, maybe she's depressed, or, you know, so, um, so fatigue, I think, is definitely a big thing that um, you will see in teens, and it could be something beyond they just want to lay on the couch all the time. Difficulty concentrating, irritability, sleep problems, either sleeping too much or not sleeping enough can be an issue with anxiety. And then isolation that really impacts other parts of life. So a little bit of isolation in adolescence is normal, especially isolating away from your parents, your caregiver. A little bit of that is normal. Um, they don't want to hang out with you as much. You have dinner and they don't want to watch TV with you. They want to go hang out in their room. They want to be on their cell phone talking to their friends. A little bit of that is normal. But when it starts to just kind of consume everything um, to where they're skipping meals, they're not hanging out at all, they're not talking to you at all, they're completely skipping family events, things like that, that's when it becomes a little bit more concerning. Um, but a little bit of kind of wanting to pull away and not spend so much time with you is a normal teenager thing. Do folks have thoughts on some of the common stressors that youth might face? School, parents. <laughs> Those are two big ones, yes. <laughs> Friends. Friends. College. Mm -hmm. Education, getting yourself ready. I grew up in a really small town in Kansas. Um, I was thinking about this, My since we're right here next to Stanford and my partner works at Stanford, um, my hometown, you could probably multiply it by six times and it would fit within Stanford still. Um, so, but just kind of thinking like um, what I went through to kind of prepare for school and to prepare myself for college and seeing what youth are doing now, I'm just like, wow, okay, it's a lot. So a lot of this, you already said, it's so really grappling with identity changes and trying to come to terms with what might be going on internally. Family issues, for sure. Educational achievement, absolutely. Um, getting really prepared for that long term. You gotta get ready now for high school. You gotta, in high school, you gotta get ready for college. And, and that's really hard to understand when it's really hard for them to sort of forecast into long term. Um, you know, long term consequences is really hard to think about. What do you want your life to look like when you're 25, if you're 13? Um, but they're kind of being pushed into that with school, of like prepare for a year, two years, five years, 10 years in advance. Um, so the, the miss between those two can sometimes be really challenging for youth to navigate. Fitting in with peers, absolutely. Somebody mentioned that the influence of social media is huge um, in society right now. Thinking back to when I was in middle school was when like dial up came out. Um, so just, you know, thinking back to when I was in middle school, it was like a big deal if you sent somebody an email. And now we've got, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, I can't even think of the others, you know, there's, um, and like just the, the consumption of social media and how life within your phone or your computer is kind of just as real as real life, so. I'm thinking too, like, um, maybe this is like later, but just 
another layer is the feedback we're trying to deal with the mental health issue. Mm -hmm. if, if in fact they are depressed or have anxiety, that's just that one more layer for them to have to deal with. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. A lot of mental health issues, a lot of mental health challenges, a lot of problems begin to manifest in teenage years and also young adulthood. So um, psychosis is another example of something that tends to manifest itself in young adulthood. So um, yeah, that's a totally a different layer, a totally new layer to have to factor and think about. So on top of all of these things that we've mentioned, LGBTQ plus youth are also worried about their identity and kind of asking themselves, what happens if I don't fit the norm? And will everyone accept me? These are two massive questions that LGBTQ youth are carrying with them day in and day out on top of all the other challenges that they're facing. All right, now let's get into the really exciting stuff. Um, so this kind of stuff is what we kind of spend all of our time discussing um, in like two slides from now, just that one slide in and of itself in our presentation, um, we can easily turn into a two hour training. So <laughs> I'm going to try to provide at least an overview in terms of gender and sexuality. So we often get questions from folks, you know, like if we're working with teenagers and young adults like, well, but do, you know, do they kind of know what's going on or like, do they understand orientation? Do they understand sexuality? And the short answer is yes. Yes and kind of no, um, but mostly yes. So gender identity really kind of begins to develop in childhood. So by two, most kids can note physical differences like between boys and girls. By three, most children are able to create a label for themselves that they use. And by four, most children have a stable sense of their gender identity. I say most, but not all. Also, as we're going to talk about in just a little bit, it can change because identity is fluid. So that's why I was saying like yes and no and kind of and maybe so. And then also youth begin developing a, sen a sense of their sexual orientation by late childhood to early adolescence. So. This is also all happening while they're also dealing with puberty and their body just going all over the place and all these other stressors we just talked about. Gender and sexuality also impact our whole life experience. These are not just physical things. They're not just emotional. They are social. They are spiritual. They are mental, psychological, physical. So your sense of gender and sexuality impacts all of you. Um, and it sort of plays out differently in various ways in your life. So um, if we think about our lives and we think about kind of the totality of who we are, most people, you know, if I was to say like, for those in the room who identify as male, like how many of you are like 100% all the time on all these things? And very few people would actually raise their hand. So, and when we think about all of the different pieces that make up our, our being, our body, like there is sort of fluidity in terms of how we see ourselves in relation to things like masculinity or femininity or other. Does that make sense? So identity can be fluid throughout life. So as we talked about a couple of slides ago, the brain doesn't finish developing until 25. So there is the possibility that you're not quite done, not fully baked is another way to say it, until much later into your 20s. So it is possible that identity can change. So it's sort of a both and of, by the time someone enters teenage years, they have a sense of their identity, but it may not be the final version. That's all to say though, that it doesn't necessarily mean it's not real, or sort of the phrase that sometimes uses, like it's just a phase, um, or it's just a thing. Um, they're kind of different because it might be a thing for right now, but it's still very much a, a real, it's like their truth right now. Even if it might not be their truth in 10 years, it's their truth right now. And their experience now, and their experience five years ago, and their experience in 37 years are all very true and valid, even if they're all completely different from each other. So what is the current context of our gender and sexuality? Think about, it's 2019, we're in the US, we're in California, we're in the Bay Area. If you were to think of, if you were to think of gender, 
what, um, what words, specific words might come to mind or what labels come to mind? Male and female are the two big ones. So kind of within, within the context of the US and our society right now, we have the two primary options, male and female in terms of gender. We, we call that the gender binary. So it sort of exists that there are two options and those are basically the two options and you should be one or the other. Um, and there's not really anything else. Um, there's not anything in between. These two options are distinct from each other and the sort of assumption that exists within our societies, that's it, male, female. And in terms of sexuality, the assumption is primarily heterosexual. People are assumed, the assumption, the sort of mainstream sort of preferred option is straight or heterosexual. So it's the context that we exist within in our society. Um, just as someone who identifies as transgender, to point out there the difference between sex and gender, the, the male, female is sex, and right. you know, masculine and feminine is gender. Exactly. That's what I've, you know, I didn't know that either until I started learning about it. Yeah. So there, yeah, so there is some difference, especially with the kids yeah. who work at high school and they pick that up pretty quickly now. Yeah, absolutely. There is definitely a difference. I would say, though, often, though, the two get lumped yes. together into just that they are the same. Um, but in on our next slide, we'll actually talk about how they're a little, yeah, for sure, different. But, but those are, that's sort of the context that people have to navigate within. Like, you get two options, you need to pick one or the other, stay there, don't change, and kind of just function within that. That's the context that sort of exists within our world here. So again, this slide in particular um, is what I was just mentioning we can do like two hours on. So we're going to do a very, very brief version of this. So anyone want to take a guess at this fun acronym here? No wrong answers. Well, technically there are, but yeah. no, no missed points for not getting it correct. Sexual orientation. Exactly. <laughs> so yes, so this acronym, Sexual Orientation, Gender Identity, and Expression, um, in case folks who are going to be listening to the recording couldn't hear, this is kind of how we're reframing what we like maybe used to call like an LGBTQ 101. We're framing it this way as SOGI because all of us, regardless of whether you're queer or gay or lesbian or trans or cis or whatever you are, all of us experience sexual orientation and gender identity. So this is something that impacts all of us and we all move through the world experiencing. This isn't just a thing that LGBTQ people experience. This is something that we're all part of. So kind of intentionally framing it this way as sort of an invitation that everyone fits in here somewhere in like three minutes or less, the gender experience. So there's two big pieces of this, gender and sexuality. And within each of these, there are pieces that make each up. So exactly what you were talking about. So a big piece of the gender experience is your sex, which is assigned at birth. So you're born, typically you're born and there's a doctor somewhere in the vicinity of you being born. The doctor holds you up. They look between your legs. Based on what they see, they typically announce it's a boy or it's a girl. That's typically how it goes. So this is a label that is placed upon you when you're born based on primarily your genitalia. However, it's not always um, clearly defined between what we might call male or female genitalia. Um, there are many individuals in the world who have a combination of genitalia or have a combination of hormones or chromosomes that we typically would assign as either male or female. These individuals are called intersex. It may or may not be noticeable when they're first born. It might not ever actually be noticeable externally. It might not become noticeable externally until maybe puberty, things like that. Prevalence, um, if you've met a naturally redheaded person, chances are that you've met someone who's intersex. They are a similar percentage of the population. So, but again, sex is something that's assigned, it's a label placed on you when you're born. Gender identity is your experience, your internal experience of yourself and the way you carry yourself through the world. 
that could be masculine, it could be feminine, it could be a combination of those, it could be neither, it could be both. There are a variety of identities that exist in terms of gender, but this is really about how you see yourself and how you know yourself to be. The final piece is gender expression, which is your outward presentation of who you are to the world. So this is your clothing, your hair, the activities you participate in, um, your dress, your manner of speech, all of these things. It's how you show yourself to the world. That's your gender expression. Are gender identity and gender expression sort of centered of gender, or how, how are those three things? All three of these make up the gender experience. It's just identity is internally how you see yourself, and expression is how the rest of the world sees you. All of these things could align with each other. They could all be kind of different. Um, so your gender identity, how you see yourself, may or may not be the same as how you show the world. One, one particular reason why that not be, might not be the case is you're worried about safety. So you identify a certain way, but you are terrified of everyone around you to know that and see that, and so you look different than you actually feel. So it's always really important, and I'll mention this in a few slides, to never assume what someone's identity is just based on how they, how they look and how they show up in the world. That in and of itself is a huge contributor to anxiety for LGBTQ. It's a sort of sense of like, if I were myself, it might not go well. So I'm gonna be, I'm gonna look like something that I really don't feel. And that can be a really big challenge. And so can this, when we talked about a little while ago about things being fluid, so can this also then be fluid for a while, especially pre-puberty? And I'm, so, I'm actually since two years of age, I mean, I know we have elementary school children who are transgender. I mean, so it can be fluid out this period. Yeah, definitely your identity and your expression for sure can be fluid. The sex that's signed at birth, not so much because it's kind of thrown on you when you first arrive in the world, but for sure your identity and your expression definitely can change and shift and grow and develop over life. So we like metaphors at Outlet and we work a lot with youth. So this is a new metaphor that we just created. So we call this the gender ocean. So if you imagine the body of water that is the ocean, imagine that like your physical body. And a part of your physical body is the sex that you were assigned at birth. Within the ocean, we have a lot of fish floating around, but they're inside the ocean. So unless you're down there in the ocean, you can't see them. So the fish that are in the ocean, that's like our gender identity. It's internal, it's kind of down inside, you can't necessarily see it. And just like there are many fish in the sea, there are many gender identities. But the part of the ocean that you can see would be the, the only thing you can't see in that picture, the waves. So that's what you see. You see the surface of the ocean. You see the waves. And that's like our gender expression, because that's sort of the outward presentation. That's what you see of me is how I express myself to the world. So that's our our overview of the gender ocean. Questions on any of that? Yeah, um, so uh, you described gender identity as a very subjective thing. What is known about what the underlying, are there any um, uh, biological or physical underpinnings to uh, gender identity that you can describe? I would say no. I think it's a lot, it's really a cultural social construct. Um, the sort of expectations and sort of the assumptions that go with a gender are built on top of it by the society and the context that it exists within. Does that help? Well, I guess um, I'm struggling a bit to, to understand that. Like, I guess what I'm at is there's some kind of common underpinning that uh, an individual would, like, uh, would an individual develop a different gender identity in a different uh, society or different social context? They totally could. There are a lot of societies that exist with more than two genders. 
Some have up to like seven. Um, so definitely the cultural and societal piece is really key in understanding how identity would develop. So, so a, a child or an adolescent is like <coughs> absorbing those gender roles from their society and then internalizing that and deciding whether it fits or whether it doesn't. To sort of get like a crash course on what that looks like, go to Target and walk around in the toy section. Um, I did that one day a few weeks ago and was like, oh, it'll be okay. And then within like 20 minutes, wanted to like knock toys off shelves. And um, so, cause uh, yeah, a lot of it is really just absorbed and seen through what we see around us. But then does that, I, I, I don't know, I'm not saying that this is what you're saying, but, but then does that bring up the question that it's a choice? It's a very good question. My answer is no. I don't think that these are, are choices, like in an inherent, like, oh, I just decided I woke up today and I'm thinking I want to wear a red shirt. Like, it's not, they're like on a very separate sort of level from each other. Because I think each person, as they grow and develop, goes through their own development of really understanding, like, what is it, what does it mean to be me? Um, and that's not just something that I woke up on a Friday and I decided X, Y, and Z and I put those away and on Saturday I was this and on Sunday I was that. So I think the idea of fluidity, the possibility of change is different than just saying like, oh, it's just a choice and you're just deciding to be this way. That's why the point of the part that society plays to me is sort of like sort of house there, but that person is still dealing with their inner beings of who they are, right. despite society. Exactly. How do you say, you know, somebody whose gender identity is different than their sex, and then, you know, that comes, <clears throat> that becomes clear when they're very young, like two or three years old. Is there a way to find out about how, like, all the toys on the toy shelf and all the girls in pink, how boys in blue and all that stuff, how that affects? their ability to um, be who they are. I mean, I'm thinking, you know, you used to be a really strong person to stick with who you are, but at the same time, it's about this, this social stuff telling you, I'm not such a hot idea. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so I think every person, especially depending upon the age that they start, you know, kind of grappling with understanding, um, and sort of the context they find themselves in, in terms of their family, in terms of their environment, and every every day they have to have to explore whether or not it's safe um, to really sort of step up and sort of demonstrate and show the world who they really are, or to um, as a word that's used to to pass to pass off as something else, um, and every single day is is that struggle and that walking that balance. Um, and then it becomes layered. Maybe they feel comfortable at home, but not at school or vice versa. Maybe they feel comfortable at school, but not at home, or they feel comfortable with certain family members, but not others. And it just becomes this huge process. Um, and it can be potentially, not always, but potentially really damaging to mental health to have to navigate this day in, day out. So one example I can think of my last trip to Target there was this, um, it was called like a command center. It was a little toy. It was like a flip up table. No, it was just called a, it was like a flip up table of some sort. And there was a pink box with a girl on it. And when you opened the table, it was a salon so that the girl could like brush her hair and do her makeup and all that sort of stuff. And then next to it was a blue box with a boy on it. And when that table opened, it was a command center. So he could like, you know, work on the science mission and help the space shuttle get home and whatever. They were the identical product. They just looked, they were just different colors. Um, so that's that society saying these are different, but it's all the same material, same product. So, but that's the overlay of expectations on somebody should have this box and somebody else should have that box. I don't mean to stop, you know, just sort of but it, do you have a um, do you have a, a presentation about how parents how to help parents whose kids are this? 
help you get through it? We'll talk a little bit more about support and kind of what that looks like, but um, I think I mean I think at the at the end of the day, just really allowing youth to be who they are um, and to to kind of take the lead on um, what works for them, you know, in terms of clothing, in terms of activities, and in terms of toys, and I think. To a level, you know, the conversation you might have with like a five-year-old about that versus like a 16-year-old is really different. But also having open conversations of like, this could be really tough. You know, like if you want to maybe dress a certain way when you go to school, like I absolutely support you. It could be really tough. Let's talk about what that would look like and kind of just having some openness with your child about um, what they might run into and... Um, how to potentially navigate that but yeah, there's actually a panel next um week i think on thursday that i'm on um right here it's about we have I don't know, six to eight um transgender individuals and parents of you know and so forth so anybody who's interested in that specific topic definitely come back it's really interesting it's been a long time to get here i don't want to make this about me and stuff you but yeah but that'll be a really good panel to come to yeah, a member, a member of the outlet team will be on the panel as well. So the other aspect of not just gender, but also we also talk about sexuality and there's pieces that make up this. So sexual orientation is kind of broadly defined as like the types of people, the experiences, the roles that you're sort of attracted to or drawn to in terms of a sexual way. Your sexual identity is often thought of as like the label that you have for yourself. So gay, lesbian, bi, pan, queer, asexual, there's a lot of terms. You don't have to memorize them all. There's not a pop quiz. Sexual status is thought of as like um, who you're with at any given time, like the, the number of partners you have and who you're with at any given time. And there's also an element of the actual sexual behaviors that people participate in and how that relates to their sexuality. So it's not just my sexuality is encompassed entirely by the label that I give myself. There's a lot more that goes into that. So I might have a particular orientation to a type of person or a type of gender or a type of body part. It might not even be about gender at all in terms of your orientation. It might be about specific body parts that you're into, which may or may, not, may, or may not be the same as the identity that you currently carry. Um, an example in our other training where we spend two hours on this, um, there's a quote that I have that says, I'm a bisexual girl and my boyfriend is also bi, but if we're together, does that make me straight? And my response would be, I don't know, does it? <laughs> if you identify as straight, great, okay. If you're not, okay. So, you know, two people who have an orientation that's bisexual, but in terms of identity, they're in what would appear to be a heterosexual relationship but they may or may not actually be heterosexual. So, and then also to stick with metaphors, we're not gonna go into all of this, but within the gender ocean, we have sexuality island. And again, it's a whole other part, but these are two significant portions of experience that we all hold. We're not officially sponsored by Nissan, by the way. Hey, Sprouse, if you're watching this, I love you. I mean, that was more of just like a long form process since I knew around middle school that I was into, you know, more than just guys. I realized wow. I was queer in high school. I was 14 years old when I was outed as being gay. Being outed was probably one of the worst experiences of my life. So I was actually 17 when I first came out um, and it was a very organic process. My mom, after picking me up from school, took this weird drive that we never really take and then pulled over. I first came out as bi at the end of uh, eighth grade, the summer between eighth and ninth grade. I told my sister. She was the first person that I told. And it was really funny because I'd gone to public school prior to that and all of my friends uh, teased me. Oh, you're going to private school. It's all girls. You're going to become a lesbian. I was like, oh, you guys don't know anything. I'm so straight. <laughs> and I'm just so not straight. I went to Catholic school and Sex homosexuality wasn't even a thing, so I doubt bisexuality would have even been a topic we could say in class. This girl got really drunk on Mike's Hard Lemonade, and I ended up taking her home in a cab, and I 
looked up at her and made eye contact with her and like just this weird feeling kind of rushed over my body um, and I realized I had just fallen in love with this girl out of nowhere who I didn't know. And then at that moment I kind of knew the direction that she was heading towards and she asked me very bluntly if I was gay and already I could see in her eyes that there was no kind of malicious intent in her asking me and so with tears in my eyes, I just kind of said, yeah, mom, I am gay. And I just started breaking down crying because it was so cathartic and my mom was just kind of looking at me like, it's not that serious. And so I would like come to school in like a skirt or something and someone would be like, oh my God, you're wearing a skirt. And I was like, guys, I, I do this. Like I've, that's always been something that I've done. And just because I'm a lesbian, like we're gonna make a whole big to do about the fact that I am wearing a skirt or makeup or something like that. I actually told my best friend that I was bi the first day that I moved into college. And by my sophomore year, I'd finally told everyone. Um, and I told them via Instagram. My dad was the only one who took it a little bit hard. He was more upset th at the fact that I sent him a link to my Instagram post instead of calling him. Coming out as trans was a lot harder because I didn't have language to describe gender identity until I got to college. And yet, if you're not entirely sure of who or what you are from the second you come out of the womb, people like to invalidate what you have to say about who you are. If you're thinking of coming out to your parents and you're pretty sure they're accepting, maybe just tell them in person. Don't don't put it on Instagram and give them a link. But other than that, you know, it was a pretty positive experience and I wouldn't really regret it or change when I did it or how I did it. But it also taught me that coming out and sharing who you are doesn't necessarily need to be a grand gesture and a large experience. It can be very personal and it can be very intimate and it can just be you starting to live your life openly. So I use that kind of a segue into the next part, which is to kind of frame that I think for LGBTQ youth, a big aspect of the anxiety that they might face growing up is around the coming out process and what that looks like. So I have a few slides kind of on like what the coming out process looks like and some slides on like how to respond, how to act, things like that um, if you have someone in your life who comes out. Um, and this is kind of a way, sort of a broad-based way to help decrease that sense of concern and fear that youth have as they're sort of navigating through the world. So that's kind of how I'm framing this whole thing. I call coming out the lifelong gift. Um, so coming out is definitely not something that just happens once and then you're done and you never have to deal with it ever again. Um, basically, once you start coming out, you keep coming out for the rest of your life. It looks differently in different, in different situations. Um, the first few times it might be this really big, like intense deal, and then later on it's like, oh yeah, by the way, I'm gay, um, moving on. Um, so, but it definitely is something that continues to happen all the time throughout life. It definitely can create a lot of stress and anxiety for folks, but in the end I call it a gift because it's an opportunity for folks to be more present and to be more true and to be more existent in terms of who they are in the world after they've had that opportunity to come out. So. It may not feel like a gift right away. It may take like 15, 20 years for it to feel like a gift, but eventually there's sort of that realization of like, now I can actually be who I am and share that with the world. So there's at least thinking broadly, there are two, two types of coming out or two sort of aspects to coming out. One being related to sexual orientation and the other being related to gender identity. So you might have someone come out actually multiple times um, they might come out maybe as lesbian, and then they might come out as trans, or non-binary, or gender fluid, or um, all these different things. So it's not just a like, oh, you are gay, cool, end of discussion, move on. No, like um, there are different ways that it could look. There are different sort of ways that coming out plays out, different timing. It's not just a, like I came out to everyone all the time at the same moment. It could be that way, but often it sort of is a staggered thing. So actually uh, yeah, on that last comment, sure. Uh, fluidity. So how does you know someone says okay I'm on this way okay, or I'm by how do they know or how do you how do you go about are you saying they just 
over time they kind of refine you know, which one they are. The fact that identity can change doesn't mean that it will. So there is the possibility of fluidity, but it doesn't mean that everyone is fluid. So someone might come out at 21 and tell you, I'm a lesbian, and that's it. And not, you know, it doesn't change. But someone might come out once and say, I, am, I identify as this, and then fast forward five years, and they're like, actually, no, my identity's changed, and I now identify as this. So there's the possibility it could change over time, but it's not uh, like a given. The, in terms of the two types, kind of referring to um, particularly for individuals who identify as trans, there's like a, a sort of a broad assumption that being transgender has to do with your orientation, your sexual orientation, and it doesn't. It's all about gender identity. So there's sort of like, you know, someone comes out as trans and, there might, and then there's like, so you're gay? And it's like, no, I am trans being gay or straight or whatever is completely separate. So someone might come out about something related to their gender identity and then may or may not also come out about something related to their sexual orientation. And the two can be distinct. Uh, I had a question about, uh, about coming out. What, what I realized is that in addition to the, to the child coming out as parents, you have to come out too. Uh, over and over and over, and I and I uh, realized after a little while that I uh, I had been doing that on my kids' behalf to lots of like groups of friends or family or you know group, these kinds of groups of people, and it's 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 that's what my kid prefers. But I I'm starting to wonder now if it's a disservice to do that. Is there something that you know that they could gain by doing it themselves. These are these are all uh, supportive, you know, groups of people. There's no issue of um, any, you know, any of anything like violence or getting a bad reaction. It's just, I think, like avoiding some that you know a, a confrontation from my from my kids' side. Mm -hmm. So I just wondered if you had any thoughts about um, pros and cons of doing it for your kid if they don't want to. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about it, um, I think, on the next slide a little bit. But I think in some of these situations, I think it's always as, as much as possible supporting with your child's lead. So really just checking in with your child or if you're working, if you're connected to someone else's child, like connecting with them, kind of like, how do you want to navigate this? Do you want to tell, you know, your aunts and uncles, your grandma, whoever, like, do you want me to tell folks? And kind of just continuing to kind of check in on that of like, do you want to take the lead on this? Do you want to not discuss this right now? Are you fine if I just tell everybody? Like, but I think just really involving your child in that process to help in the decision making. Um, so as long as it feels comfortable, that I don't think there's like necessarily pros or cons about like whether you do all of it versus whether they do. Just as long as it's a decision making process that they're part of and that it's not being taken from them. So, so yeah, in terms of coming out, folks might come out to parents or caregivers, to sco at schools, to friends or teachers, and to extended family, religious communities, et cetera. And these can kind of happen over a span of time. Coming out can have serious consequences, violence, whether verbal or physical, loss of friends, family or safety at home, and the potential emotional distress and potential for self-harm. So this is really, where a lot of the anxiety might set in as folks are really thinking, what would it look like to come out? What would I say? How would I do it? Who am I going to tell? Concerns about all this really sets in and gets that anxiety going. So if someone comes out, some ideas on how to respond to that person. First off would be to express gratitude, which is something as simple as, wow, thank you so much for sharing this with me. That's a really big thing. I feel really, um, honored that you trust me with that information. Great place to start. Kind of really just sort of taking a step back, sort of setting that tone. Wow, thank you, I really appreciate that. The next thing we would encourage folks then to ask about openness. So kind of checking in, who else are you out to? Who else knows? How should I refer to you in front of other family members or your friends or your parents or your teachers? Like. Um, how should, you know, what name should I use? How should I refer to you if we're in other spaces? And then kind of related, like asking, like, do you want support in telling other people? Or do you want to, you know, do you want to take care of that process? Do you want me to be involved? Kind of really exploring that with folks. 
I think it's always helpful and important to be honest. If you don't understand a word or a phrase that someone's using, I think that can go a long way to just really be like, you know, I've not really heard that word. I have no idea what that means. Could you tell me what that means for you? What does that mean for your life? Can I think be really helpful? Um, also letting folks know that you're someone that they can talk to and that you can, that you support them. So it could be things like, you know, please let me know if you want to talk further. I think um, this came up at a, I was at a GSA earlier today and the, I, the question of like, well, what if something bad happens to someone? Like how should I step in to, to address or to support them? Should I let them handle it? Should I try to be an ally and really step in and like help address it? And I think it's always important to ask, like if something happens and that's what this last question says, if someone does or says something, how do you want me to respond? Do you want me to step in? and try to provide some support. Do you want me to address it? Do you want me to call that person out? Do you want to take care of it? Or do you want me to hang back? Because um, we might feel like I want to really like get in there and like that's not okay and it needs to be addressed. That could be further disempowering if you sort of step in and do it for them. Some thoughts on how to act when folks come out, really being sure that you're protecting confidentiality, having conversations in a private space, really checking in about who else knows ask for permission before you give any advice, regardless of whether it's coming out or any other topic. I think that's like a key for working with youth and young adults. Ask permission first before you just start telling them what to do. Um, youth have a really great um, BS meter, as a way to put it. Um, and if they feel like you're being disingenuous or talking down to them, it's the best way to just sort of shut them off. So I think that's a really key thing um, helping a, folks explore if they might need a safety plan, if they're going to come out to other folks, if there's safe people they can talk to, alternative options, if home isn't safe, resources that they might be able to connect with. And then again, be honest about what you do and you don't know. And also it's okay to have questions and concerns. I think we, we see this a lot, like parents and family and caregivers are worried, like, what if I don't know everything? Or like, I'm trying to figure this all out for myself and I don't understand what's going on. That's all totally 100% okay. We're not expecting like your child comes out and you're just instantly an expert. No, like you're gonna be in your own process too and that's all totally okay. The best types of responses are these, honesty, love, curiosity, acceptance and support countered against the worst type of responses Things like violence and hate and anger and shame and rejection. So if you take nothing else away from this presentation, this is the key. Providing support, showing that you're open, showing that you love and you care for that youth is the key. That is the, um, putting my like research clinician hat on for just a second, like research shows that providing and demonstrating support the single biggest indicator of long-term success as compared to the other side, which is going to lead to the best opportunity for challenges, concerns, damage, hurt, pain, and suffering. I have a question. So, I mean, this kind of presupposes that, that the person knows the answers. Like they know, you know, how they want to be treated, whether or not they want to be in a pain. Is that common that most people, where they kind of, I don't know if I'm supposed to. If I'm supposed to tell people, or if you're supposed to tell them. But how do you help work through that? Um, I think it's just going to be really a matter of conversation um, with your child or the child that you're, you know, supporting or working with. And I would say, like, if if someone's currently in a space of like, I don't really know, like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do or what I'm supposed to say, that might maybe suggest that now is not the greatest time to really dive in and open it up. So, um, I think a lot of it too is just having continued kind of conversation of like, let's talk about this now. Like, where are you at? Okay, you're still kind of thinking or you're sort of concerned about some things. Great, let's maybe check in a little bit later. Um, so kind of just making it then just sort of a natural part of your conversation. Because, yeah, it also is going to change over time. Some, sometimes folks might be really feeling empowered and really like, yes, I want to get out there. I want to share my identity. Sometimes it can get really draining to come out over and over and over and over again. So then they might move into a space where they're like, I kind of just want to sit on this for now. 
Um, so I think it's just really about like the active communication to really allow the child to lead. Yeah, I, I think that that's just a really good question. What comes to my mind too is that I think that sometimes the youth themselves don't really know and don't, I mean, they're dealing with all of these emotions, all of these feelings, all of these questions that they themselves have. Yeah. And so that to me <clears throat> is the importance of leading them to the outlet program, or letting them talk to other youth there, letting them talk to people who know, who do the research and who know how to deal with these issues, or to a GSA group or club, um, or even just a private therapist or whatever, to just talk about these issues and how you deal with them, um, to bring down some of their fear, some of their anxiety that they're going through. Yeah. Because they might not have all the words and know the conversation or have the answers and they're probably you know and of course their parents don't have that they have. yeah and i think just kind of like stepping into that space and having a really active like it's okay to not know exactly what's going on for yourself or to have some of these questions like i have a lot of the same questions too i don't like just having like some really intentional honesty about that i think can really help to sort of create a sort of calming and just help to really reduce that anxiety and then yeah like we can maybe find someone who you can connect with or talk with or there's peer spaces you know like things like that where sort of some safer spaces where folks can kind of explore and sort of check that with other people um, but i think just the really being honest about where you're at and what you do and don't know can really go a long way i think i talked a little bit about on this so I think a really important part of this as caregivers is just kind of continue to do your own learning and exploration I think that can always be beneficial as you then turn to sort of connect back with the youth in your lives um, and kind of just some broader pointers just you know kind of modeling and modeling and encouraging empathy and respect for all people this kind of goes beyond just gender and orientation, but really just being that model of what it looks like to be a good person. Um, calling out and discussing absolutes and stereotypes related to gender and orientation, kind of having like moments of like, oh, only, only boys are in sports. Really? Why do you think that is? What does that mean? Let's talk about that. What does that actually look like to say that only boys are in sports or, um, you know, kind of just to really show a, a willingness to sort of enter into some of those conversation spaces with your youth and with other youth in your life can be really helpful to kind of just get sort of that pause of like, oh wait, why do I actually think this? Let's look at that for a moment. Again, we mentioned earlier, like don't in, not assuming someone's gender or their orientation based on how they look, avoiding inappropriate comments, jokes, patronizing language, um, things like, oh my God, you're so brave. I could never do, I could never, I couldn't do what you're doing. You're just so like, can feel really, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Invalidating, um, to kind of hear that over and over of, uh, a lot too. Uh, responding to discrimination and creating space and sort of this, like it's okay to allow time um, for folks to explore maybe they don't have maybe they came out to you or to another family member but they're really not sure kind of what the rest of it looks like and just really allowing that space and time for folks to to sort of work through that um, just a little bit on language um, listen to the language that someone's using and mirror it reflect that back to them pronouns are really important this is a huge part of it um, so if you're unsure of someone's pronouns, just ask. Um, or just maybe start asking everybody. That's, that's the best thing. Another way, another tool is like, when you introduce yourself, just like I did when I started, like introduce yourself and share your pronouns just so everyone knows and they have that. Um, I would say if you're going to make that a habit of asking people about their pronouns and asking people to share their pronouns with you, ask everyone. Don't just ask people that you're sort of like, mm, not sure about you ask everyone um, because then it becomes non-inclusive if you're just like I think uh, well, maybe not that person you know like so ask everybody um, this could be really helpful with youth using gender inclusive language so things like what are your parents names versus what's your mom and dad's name 
There are many reasons that a child may not have a mom and a dad, not just based on like maybe they have two dads, like, like there are a number of reasons why someone might just have one parent or no parents. Um, so what are your parents' names or like what are your caregivers' names versus something like what's your mom's name, your dad's name? Are you in a relationship versus saying like, do you have a boyfriend or a girlfriend? And then things like, hey folks, or hey y'all, hey everybody, versus hey guys and guys and gals, boys and girls, kind of really trying to steer away from that gendered language. When you mess up, notice it says when you mess up, not if you mess up, when you mess up. I mess up all the time to my own coworkers. Um, acknowledge it, correct yourself out loud, fix it, use the right word, offer a simple apology, and then move on. My coworker, so-and-so, he was saying, oops, sorry, they were saying that they're going to a training next week. It's as simple as that. It doesn't have to be this big, like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I'm gonna try really hard next time. I, like, I'm, I'm really committed, I'm really into it. Like, I'm trying so hard, I'm really sorry. I really don't mean to offend you. Like, that just becomes all about you and your experience and has nothing to do with them and begins to have people feel like their identity is an issue and a problem for you. So just simply correct yourself, use the right terminology, and move on. Questions on any of that? This, I think, just this simple, like changing, kind of having some intentionality around language can really go a long way to helping youth in particular feel less anxious and feel more safe. Um, another thing, another easy thing to do is also just like having you know, having a rainbow sticker in the window, like just simple things like that, that youth definitely pick up on, kind of establishes like a sense of safety and like, okay, this person, I could probably feel a little bit better around this person. Um, this is something I always like to touch on um, in trainings like this, behaviors and beliefs. Um, I kind of got this from the Family Acceptance Project up in San Francisco. They really talk about um, focusing on, so again, so showing ex support and acceptance are the most important aspect of this to help your youth feel valued, to help their anxiety go down, to help them feel less isolated and more like they're part of a community. And again, you can and really should be on your own journey as well of increasing your understanding, your connection to what's going on in your child's life. It's okay to have uncertainties and questions. It's absolutely okay. Um, I think there's a lot of really big anxiety on the part of caregivers of like, oh no, I gotta figure this all out. And I don't know. Please take your time and take your space to kind of figure out for yourself what's going on. So really this kind of boils down to your behaviors can change even if your beliefs don't. You might have like still like, I don't really, I don't know that I'm like kind of on board with all of this and I don't get those words. That's totally okay. Your behaviors can still change even if the beliefs that you have end up not really changing. There's examples of this all over the place in life. Does anyone have ideas on how your behaviors and your beliefs don't have to line up? I'm guessing most people think it's kind of like, why do I have to go 30 miles an hour on the side streets? I'm in a hurry, I have places to be yet you still, relatively speaking, follow the speed limit because you don't want to get a ticket, all of these things. So that's on a, obviously a very different level than supporting an LGBTQ youth, um, you know, but at least one example of how you can still adapt and change your behaviors and how you relate to someone, even if you're kind of in a different place than they are in terms of the beliefs and the values that you hold. A few other ideas to help reduce anxiety um, having a willingness to discuss LGBTQ topics with your children. So one route might, might be to explore examples of LGBTQ plus people in the media um, and ask your children what they think about it. You know, watch a TV show or a movie um, that involves LGBTQ characters and kind of then have a discussion with your youth. Like, hey, what did you think about that character? You know, what came up for you? You know, what did you think of how that person was kind of woven into the storyline? Kind of just having a discussion to kind of hear what your youth are thinking about these topics. Do you find that 
that that that people like talking about their sexuality or it's not like I like talking about the fact that I'm you know, heterogeneous male. I mean, it's kind of it's not like there's a desire to talk about. It. Yeah, sure. Um... I think part of this can help sort of increase some comfort, not so much in that like we're gonna be like, all right, so you saw that like gay character. What are you, are you gay? You know, like, so like not, like not thinking, you know, not thinking it's kind of going, in, but just to kind of really show like, this is something that we could talk about, you know, if this happened to like be part of your experience or kind of just to really demonstrate like I am open and I'm willing to kind of dive into some of these topics with you if you want to, or if this maybe is part of what your experience is. Um, but yeah, certainly not pushing or probing or kind of like, but just kind of, you know, and, and kind of exploring, um, you know, how maybe like how that um, person in that, say, movie, how that person fits into the storyline and kind of just exploring it kind of on a broader sense of, instead of really talking to like, what did you think about that lesbian in that movie? Um, but kind of just seeing ways that it could sort of flow. Um, if you really want to connect with high schoolers, watch the movie Love, Simon. Mm -hmm. High schoolers love that movie. I also love that movie. I'm not in high school, but I love that movie. Um, it's a really great conversation starter about a youth who is in the closet, has experiences of coming out, sort of what that looks like within family. Um, it's, in a lot of ways, pretty groundbreaking because it's one of... Um, one of the first sort of major film studio productions to feature um, LGBTQ characters in a really prominent way. Um, that kind of doesn't make, um, like it makes a deal of it, but not too big of a deal of it to me, if that makes sense. Um, and there's also like good, like exciting, happy endings, um, which a lot of LGBTQ people don't get to see, so. This kind of relates, like, have, like demonstrating a willingness to talk about topics, no matter how difficult. So sort of the, like, we can talk about sex and drugs and all those really exciting things. So kind of just demonstrating in your own unique you way as a parent or caregiver, like, we can go there if you want. It might not be fun. It might not be really exciting. I'm certainly not going to have all the answers, but we can, we can really dive into these things if you want, just showing, like, that willingness. And they might be like, no, mom, no, dad, you're totally weirdo. I'm not going to do that with you. Okay, great. But just kind of really showing that you're, you have that willingness. Outlet is trying to work on getting some parent groups going. Um, there's one parent group at the San Mateo County Pride Center. And then there are, um, there's a clinician who I think most of their work is out of um, kind of San Jose who does support groups specifically to um, trans youth and their families. And some of it is integrated where the youth are with their families and also some of it is like the youth are in like one room with some like therapists and support and like the parents and families are in another one kind of talking through there and then they'll sometimes be overlapped. But again, remember that you don't have to have all the answers. Um, supporting your child's self-esteem is really important. And what's key here is to provide active positive reinforcement. So not just a general like, yeah, I think you're great. You're a lovely, like, I, of course, I love you. You're such a great child. Being really specific and being active. Like last night when you came home and you like immediately started working on your homework and I didn't even have to ask you. That was really awesome. I really like how you did that. And then after dinner, you just got up and helped me clean up the dishes. That was really cool. Thank you. Like being really active in terms of that positive reinforcement can go a long way to really boost self-esteem. If you need to offer criticism of your child about something, being really intentional about just making it about the behavior, not about them as a person. So hey, when you didn't clean up your room yesterday when I asked you to, that was, that was pretty frustrating, as opposed to like, what the hell is your problem? You're such a lazy bum. Like, you need to get off your butt and get things in order. Um, again, um, as much as feels comfortable, which I think this is probably really anxiety inducing for parents, but allowing experimentation, but also within that sort of setting and keeping appropriate safety boundaries. Um, 
I think it's really important to allow a little bit of a sense of freedom for youth, but also being really clear of what's too far in terms of safety and then kind of like you can't really go past this point. But up to that point, there's a little bit of flexibility there for you and kind of setting um, some boundaries with that and some limits. One thing I remember from my own childhood, um, my mother told me, like, no matter where you are, no matter what happens, if you're at a party, if you go out to a party and you have any amount of alcohol, you call me and I will come get you. Didn't necessarily mean I was not going to get in trouble if I went out and had some alcohol, but I certainly knew that if I went out, had any alcohol, and then got anywhere near a car, I was going to be in a lot more trouble. So that sort of boundary that my mom set. Coincidentally, I only went to two parties in high school, didn't have any alcohol, watched other people have alcohol, and thought, that's a really bad idea. Um, so, but I always knew that that existed, and I knew I could fall back on that with my mom because she was always very clear about saying that. I think it's always really important to always pay attention to your child's social media usage, kind of just understanding what they're on, kind of what they're doing. Um, I think that can be really key. Um, I want to allow like the last few minutes for questions. There's two more slides on here, which are just some more like broader, like general, like suggestions or tips for parenting, but not specific necessarily to this topic, but kind of just some general things. But wanted to allow for a few minutes, like if folks had other questions, comments, um, things you were like, I was really hoping you were going to talk about that thing, but you didn't. Could you answer my question right now? Could you tell me who the person is in Santa who works with? Um... Yeah. That clinician's name is Maureen Johnston. Is there any uh, theory or research? which can help us understand why people choose certain kind of gender identity. There are a number of theories of gender and sexuality developments. I'm trying to think of like maybe one that I would recommend starting with. Let me think on that. Um, there are a lot of books for sure. Towards the end of the packet, we have some recommendations on other resources to connect to. So a particular one to kind of get more information maybe about like gender and sexuality development, one other option to maybe check out would be Gender Spectrum. They have a really great website, especially on the gender aspect of things in terms of the development of gender. They more so focus on that versus sexuality. Yeah, there's groups like the Trevor Project um, they don't focus so much on like kind of the development of it, but yeah, I'm totally blanking on some of the books, but I'll, I'll try to think of some more to recommend. Do you have any groups of resources for um, youth who are on the topic? Is there a competition? Yes, it does. Yeah, there is, um, I don't have my phone in my pocket um, intentionally. I can't think of any like social spaces that are coming to mind, like sort of peer spaces, but there is a clinician in the area First name is Finn, last name is, I think it's Grattan, G-R-A-T-T-O-N. That individual identifies both as having autism, kind of being on the autism spectrum, and as, I would say broadly, not being cisgender. I'm not exactly sure kind of of that component of their identity, but sort of holding both aspects of that. Um, and so their website, I'm pretty sure it's Grattan, G-R-A-T-T-O-N. I can Google it really quick when we're done to make sure that I'm giving you the right but I think their website might also have some information. In terms of mental health, I know that this is kind of like an anxiety, but in terms of mental health, I don't know if you can address a little bit the um, higher numbers of who are um, questioning or identifying and depression and suicidal ideation and suicide. Yeah, so for sure, anxiety is, is a big key issue, depression definitely being one of the other key issues that youth experience. Yeah, and suicidality and self-harm, um, anywhere from two to three to four times higher um, in terms of the incidence of maybe trying to attempt suicide, other self-harm behaviors, and actually completing suicide. I'm sorry, what, do you, what, do you, what groups are you comparing when you say two, two to three times higher? So broadly thinking of LGBTQ youth, 
compared to youth who would identify as straight, cisgender. Um, it could range anywhere from two to four times um, a prevalence rate. Other issues such as substance use becomes a greater risk factor for youth. There's a higher tendency to get involved in substance use um, if they identify as LGBTQ. Um, prior to being at Outlet, I worked um, with homeless youth and young adults who nationally, 40% of whom identify as LGBTQ. Um, so there's a lot of other risk factors that start to layer over their identity, a lot of fear and a lot of actuality of youth being kicked out of their homes when they come out and coming to sanctuary places such as the Bay Area um, where they know that there are more resources, a generally more accepting attitude um, than where they came from. Resources specifically our childhood shared being by. I mean, it was actually harder, I think, because you're not sure, you know, if you're LG or P. You know, resources are one of the ones we recommend we look at to help understand what that means. Like, in terms of in terms of like that term in particular by no, 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 what that means. Uh, sure. Because it, it's not like one like if you're gay or you're lesbian, then you're gay, fine. You know where you're at. Like you're by you're kind of in this at least in my head, you're not one or the other, you're both, but I don't know what that means. Yeah, bisexuality would would mean would kind of relate to at least like attraction to at least two. But yes, the idea is that it's not like a 50-50. It's not 50% men and 50% women. It could vary, it could change, you know. It, at one point it could be like, I'm more so attracted to women right now, but I do still find attraction to men. Um, so yeah. Confusing, I mean, for me, it's <laughs> yeah. harder to understand because it's, you know, not one or the other. Right, and I, and I think this is also a good point of like, it's totally okay to not understand all the terms and exactly what they mean. What I think is most important, just be like, okay, so you're telling me you're bisexual. Okay, what does that look like for you? What does that mean for your life? And just really focusing on that personal, like for you, how do you carry your yourself through the world? Because your definition of bisexual and your definition of bisexual could end up being different. And that's, in the end of the day, that's okay. But it's just kind of really focusing on like, what does that mean for you? So, so what I hear you sort of saying is that in some ways it doesn't matter about my total understanding about it as long as I'm saying to my child, I'm accepting whoever you are, whether you're feeling more gay today, whether you're feeling more lesbian today, it doesn't really matter to me so much is that I accept you no matter what. Yeah, I think the key is showing the acceptance and the support. Because yeah, labels are labels. Sometimes they help, sometimes they're really damaging. Um, so what's most important is to show that sort of, um, and also to not get caught up into, you know, you might have like a sixth grader who tells you I'm gay and you're like, oh, okay, what does that mean for you? And they're like, well, I'm a boy and I like boys and girls. Mm -hmm. The purpose is not to be like, actually, that means you're bisexual, but just be like, oh, okay. You know, like to just really kind of sit within that kind of regardless of what the word means and if their version of the word means the Webster's definition of that word, you know, um, it's really just like, all right, cool. Like, how can I continue to support you? Do you want to talk to other people? You know, kind of having that conversation versus necessarily getting caught up in the word. Do you think helping a slightly younger child give a name to a thing that they know but don't have Words for it could be, yeah, it could be really empowering to sort of hear um, kind of descriptions on what different possibilities could look like. And I think oftentimes if, if a youth hears a word that fits to them, they're going to know. And they're going to be able to really connect to that and be like, yes, that makes sense. So I would say oftentimes people know what they aren't before they end up kind of landing on what they are. And so kind of maybe hearing some potential options and, and just realizing that that's one of the flyers I didn't bring. We have a flyer and like tips of supporting the community and on the back we have sort of some definitions. Um, but that can actually be really empowering for someone to hear something that does sync up and they're like, yes, that's it. So yeah, I think it could be really empowering for someone to hear 
Um, so there is a session next week during the same time frame. I think it's 6.30 to 8 or 6 to 8 here. Um, there will be a few members of the transgender community, um, community providers, um, a parent, right? Parents and a youth, I think, as well. So but members of the transgender community who will be here um, to talk about their experiences and to answer some questions that have kind of been facilitated ahead of time and I think also potential to answer some audience questions. So yeah, if that would be of interest to kind of learn more about some personal experiences, would definitely encourage folks to come. It's kind of an open learning opportunity for parents, for families, and for youth. Thank you.